at 11.22 a.m. on May 24th, the year 2000, Curtis Jackson, a.k.a. Boo Boo, professionally known as 50 Cent, was shot nine times while sitting in a parked car in front of his grandmother's house. This is a story of how 50 Cent and Ja Rule and Murder Inc. beef turned into a 50 Cent versus Supreme Beef, which almost cost 50 his life before he could reach stardom. This story has been told so many times in bits and pieces throughout the years, but I haven't really seen any thorough and complete breakdown of everything in one spot. So that's what I'm gonna do with this video. If you're familiar with the way I do things here, you already know I do my research and dig up all the dirt and hidden info. So you, the viewers, can have something new and refreshing to watch. I don't usually ask folks to like, but if you're enjoying the content, go ahead and do so. Without any further delay, let's get to it. Before 50 Cent was a thing, there was Ja Rule and Irv Gotti. Ja had the music scene on lock after he debuted his first album, Veni Veni Vecchi, in 99. With hit single Holla Holla on rotation everywhere. You couldn't get away from this song. It was everywhere. It's murder. Holla, holla. Ja Rule, real name Jeffrey Atkins, was born February 29, 1976, in Hollis, Queens, New York. He came from a very strict religious home. His family were Jehovah Witnesses, who didn't allow him to listen to hip hop when he was younger. So like most kids who are told they can't do something, he ended up sneaking up tapes in the house and he fell in love with what he heard. And then he decided he wanted to be a rapper. At the age of 15, Ja got with some local rappers, Chris Black and Nemesis, and they went by the name Cash Money Click. At 18, he got signed to TVT Records, an independent record label in 1994, where he connected with an up and coming DJ, DJ Irv at the time. It is very important that I explain how Irv came up because he never gets much credit for his accomplishments in the hip hop after 50 came about. Irvin Domingo Lorenzo Jr., who goes by the name Irv Gotti, was once DJ Irv Magoo. He is from Jai's neighborhood in Hollis, Queens, the same neighborhood Run DMC is from, and he used to be a local DJ back in the day. He was born on June 26, 1970, making him six years older than Ja. Hip hop was just starting to become a thing around this time, thanks to DJ Cool Irk, who started spinning the turnstile at an August 1973 dance bash. Irv began playing around with the new music genre at the time and started DJing at the age of 11. At 15, he had moved up the ladder and started DJing his neighborhood block parties. At age 17 in 1987, he was given an opportunity to DJ for a local rapper, Jazz O. He was actually flown to London where Jazz O was touring to DJ for him. While in London, he met Jazz O's protege, a young Brooklyn MC who went by the name Jay-Z. The two immediately connected and Irv became Jay's personal DJ. Jay-Z gave him the nickname Gotti. In 1995, Irv and his brother Chris Gotti started Top Dog Productions. The first artist he managed under the company was Geronimo, who got signed to TVT Records, with Irv working the deal. At TVT Records is where Irv and Josh's relationship started. Irv started managing a cash money click, which Ja Rule was a part of. The cash money click dropped two street bangers for my click and get the fortune. Irv started promoting the videos for the tracks, which caught the eye of Leo Cohen. A Def Jam executive who became more interested in the young standout Ja Rule because of his deep raspy voice and charisma. Irv then takes Ja Rule to Leo Cohen who signs Ja to Def Jam and also makes Irv Gotti an A&R rep for Def Jam. While Irv Gotti was an A&R rep for Def Jam, he attempted to sign an unknown MC, DMX who was featured in Geronimo's album along with Jay-Z. Irv had met X during the rap battle and he saw how raw and talented the Yonkers MC was before the world did. 
Def Jam wasn't too sure about DMX, so they refused, which made Irv quit his A&R position at the label. Leo Cohen, believing in Irv, decided to reach out to him and bring him back, putting him under his wing and giving him all the creative space that he needed to develop all his artistic vision. Irv then takes Leo to see DMX battle raps, where Leo became so impressed and he signed X right on the spot to Def Jam Records. Irv Gotti continued to promote and build Ja Rule up while also producing for various other artists. He played a role in Jay-Z's debut album, Reasonable Doubt, even though Jay wasn't a Def Jam artist. Producing one of Jay's classic hit, Can I Live? He then introduces Jay to Def Jam exec, Kevin Lyles. From there, Ain't No, another Jay-Z single, was put on Eddie Murphy's Nutty Professor movie soundtrack, which exposed Jay-Z to a broader audience. This is how Jay started his long run in hip-hop. His next album was funded by Def Jam, who signed him to a multi-million dollar label deal with his Rockefeller imprint. Irv Gotti's next artist to build up was DMX. On February 10th, 1998, Def Jam releases X debut single, Get At Me Dog." featuring Sheet Looch of the Locks. The video was shot at the notorious club tunnel in the city. Dev Jam wasn't really too interested and had a little faith in X, but Irv Gotti pushed for him and the record ended up peaking at the top of the charts. DMX is Dark and L is Hot, which was co-produced by Irv Gotti went on to sell 250,000 units in his first week. Almost 5 million copies sold till date. Seeing that Irv Gotti had the ears for the music, Def Jam exec Russell Simmons gave him his own record label under Def Jam. So Irv Gotti now has three hot artists that he's been instrumental to their initial success. He came up with the idea of having them all form a rap group called Murder Inc. The plan was for them to put out a collaborative album since they had previously worked together in the past. They released two songs, Murdergram and It's Murder. No album came of it as egos prevented them from working together. DMX felt Ja Rule was trying to imitate him by making his voice deeper. Get at me, dog. While Irv Gotti was watching crime documentaries during Gangster Week, a Murder Inc. logo appeared on the screen and he decided to use the name for his label because Murder Inc., which was being depicted in the documentary, put out hits for murder and Irv wanted to put out hit records. So to Irv, Murder Inc. was like a metaphor. Irv and his brother Chris Gotti both launched the label Murder Inc. Records with Ja Rule as the first leading artist. They dropped his debut solo single, Holla Holla, in anticipation for his debut album. Prior to that single, Ja was featured on Jay-Z's album, Hard Knock Life, on the track Can I Get A, which was also used for Rush Hour movie soundtrack. Can I Get A was a Ja Rule record, but Jay paid to have the record after hearing the sample, and he kept Ja on there as a feature. On June 1st, 1999, Ja Rule's album Veni Vedi Vecchi drops and debuts at number three on the US Billboard 200, selling 184,000 copies in his first week. The name Veni Vedi Vecchi comes from the Latin phrase, I came, I saw, I conquered, after the album dropped, people started to compare Ja Rule to DMX, which X wasn't too fun of. DMX actually dissed Ja on the track, We Don't Give Up, with Jada and Styles P. This is when Ja started to switch up his style and go from the gritty gangster tone and focus more on the female audience. He started singing from there on, and that turned out to be a game changer in his career. That same year in 1999, there was an up and coming rapper from around the way in Southside Jamaica, Queens. That was Curtis Jackson, AKA 50 Cent. Fifty, a local hustler, was just starting out in his music career after running into legendary Run DMC artist Jam Master J in 1996. Fifty Cent, unlike Ja Rule, 
His street ties go all the way back to his mother, Sabrina, who passed away when he was just eight years old. She used to hustle with some of the shadow figures we've read about over the years, like Notorious Kingpin, Fat Cat Nicholas, and Pappy Mason in the 80s. Fat Cat was close with another group of individuals who went by the name Supreme Team, headed by Kenneth McGriff, aka Supreme, or Prime, and his nephew, Gerald Prince Miller. Prime, who was also from the Southside Jamaica Queens neighborhood, ran a successful drug operation in the Baisley Housing Projects in Queens during the rise of the crack epidemic. Prime eventually went to prison in 1987 for drug possession, leaving Prince in power to run the show. Prince, who was more ruthless than Prime, expanded the organization, bringing in nearly half a million dollars a week. Rumor has it that bodies kept piling up with Prince in charge, but he was never charged with any of it. Instead, Prince was sentenced in 1993 to six consecutive life terms for drug trafficking. It was a war on drugs headed by local and federal authorities. Almost a decade after Prime was locked up, he was released from prison on parole in 1994, a year after Prince went in. The Supreme team he once headed was now bigger than life. Prince, before incarceration, had recruited new younger members to the crew. You had Black Just a Blackie, now part of the Supreme team as a lieutenant, and also Bimmy to name a few. Bimmy is Waka Flocka's uncle. Prem not only came home to the change in his organization, but also to the new emergent hip-hop sound that has taken over the shine of the local street hustlers. The rappers were now the new superstars and Prem won at parts. Prem eventually violated his parole by continuing his drug enterprise and was subsequently sent back in months later for another two and a half years that same year in 1994. Black Just and Bimmy, the two lieutenants, ended up holding the Supreme team down. Black Just at the time was raising up a young 50 in the streets who was from the neighborhood. It was said that Black used to pay for 50's boxing lessons. Based on the information that we now know about 50 Cent and the tales of his street hustling days, it is safe to assume he was indirectly part of the Supreme team because Black Just won't be funding his upbringing if he wasn't valuable to the operation. In the hood, the only reason other than being a coach that a grown man will keep youngers around is to tear up some shit. Remember 50 moms used to hustle with Fat Cat and them back in the day. So 50 did not need any introduction. He's from the hood. And since Prem was in and out of prison for the most part when 50 was only 12 years old, he never really got a chance to be around Prem. But his mentor or father figure was Fat Cat and he was close to Black Just. Bimmy and the team. In 1997, Prem was released from prison. The Supreme Team era was pretty much a done deal, so he had sights on the music and the movie business. He had started aligning himself with the rising DJ slash producer at the time, DJ Irv. Irv Gotti was already making a name for himself in the music business, being instrumental in the start of Jay-Z's, DMX, and Ja Rule's career. Prem had a vision of remaking Donald Goins' crime novels into hood classic movies. 50 started rapping and was eventually signed to Columbia Records in 1999. He dropped Out of Rob in August of 99, where he talks about Jack and the whole industry. And also, Ghetto Quran leaks around this time. Ghetto Quran featured lyrics of 50 paying homage to the OGs who ran his hood. Initially, this track was received well by his hood, but things started to change due to a few events. 50 and Ja Rule, who were cool at some point, started beefing, and it all started from a snub and a change situation. The story goes Ja Rule, whose name is Buzzin' at the time, had invited an unknown 50 Cent to a studio session. But when he got there, there was a bunch of Murder Inc. guys there who tried to play 50, but Ja never stepped in till the very last minute before shit was about to pop off. There was another incident where Ja Rule snubbed 50 and acted like he didn't know him while 50 was standing next to a buddy of his that relieved Ja of his chain. Prem tried to tell 50 to fall back, but 5th wasn't letting up. Around this time, 5th is catching a buzz off that Outer Rob song, and he's now touring and using security team of the notorious bank rubber Chaz Williams. What's good? This is Chaz, the CNC commander, chief of Black Hand Entertainment. Chaz was able to convince 50 to take a peace meeting with Ja in Atlanta, 
which ended up being a brawl. Ja was with a bunch of people, and 50 went to go pull him to the side to talk to him, and Ja had a Louisville bat in his hand. From the way Ja was gesturing and raising his voice, 50 took it as a threat and punched Ja in the eye while he was surrounded by Murder Inc. crew. 50 somehow manages to escape with yet another Ja chain. 50 then goes on to drop a video for Ja Rule's diss track, Your Life's on the Line, wearing Ja Rule's confiscated chain in October of 99. According to Fifth, a deal was brokered for Ja to receive his chain back in exchange for a Movado watch, a claim that Ja has denied. <laughs> I eat you for breakfast, a watch was exchanged for your necklace. Before the physical altercation in Atlanta, there was an incident where Prem pulled up the 50s block and tried to put his hands on his head. And Fit flipped it on him and rubbed his head. Prem knew from there on he couldn't control Fifth. 50 and Prem also crossed paths in Vegas while Chaz and Gene Deal was there. Gene detailed how the two locked eyes while 50 had that fire on him. So we doing parties out there in Vegas. So the night goes on and everything like that. Ja Rule and them is coming to the party. So, you know, Chaz told me to go down. Like he said, go down and make sure uh, Ja and them get through the barricades when they get ready to come up. I holler at 50. Because I really didn't know they had a bad situation at this time. I go down the parking lot and 50 is by the barricade. And he just post over the barricade just like I am right now. And he looking because Ja and them is in the limousine. So I'm like, you know, I'm looking at him. So Supreme comes out. So I say, yo, what up, Preem? And yo, Preem had this look in his eye like, yo, it's crazy. And he, he was just focusing right on 50. He didn't take his eye off 50. So I was, you know, I looked at Preem, then I looked at 50, and then I know the tension. And I was like, yo, damn, what's going on? And I was like, yo, you coming up to the party? And he was like, Nah, man, tell old man, tell old man I'm good, man. We're going to go do this other thing right now. We're not going to come up that way. And so then I know 50 got this thing on him, but still Prem ain't took his eye off 50. And 50 is hunched over like this with it on him. On December 11, 1999, Black Just, who raised 50 up, was shot in the thigh while sitting in the car with Prem. Blackie wasn't the intended target, it was for Preem. Preem had tried to play another Queens Jack boy turned rapper, E Moneybags, who was cool with 50, prodigy of Mob Deep, and had been around a few heavyweights at the time. The story goes, Preem was selling tag cars, and E Moneybag had given him a deposit for one, but later changed his mind about buying a stolen car. He had got some money from Prodigy, which was enough to put down as a deposit on a legit car which he bought, and he wanted his deposit back from Preem. He money bags kept getting spun around, and he felt like Preem was trying to play him, so he decided he was gonna kill him. He money bags had spotted Preem sitting in his Land Cruiser outside of Coliseum on Jamaica Ave, and he took some shots at him, but missed hitting Black Just. Instead of Preem driving straight to the hospital, he went back to the hood to get someone else to drive him there so he wouldn't get questioned as he's still on papers. Black just ended up bleeding out from a single shot to the leg. Prior to that incident, Prodigy had shed light on a robbery that took place where E Moneybags and Big Nose Troy, another queen stick-up kid, had robbed Ja Rule and Irv in a studio after they were allegedly set up by one of their artists, Cadillac Ty. Bags was hype about getting his navigator. Come with me to the dealership in Long Island. They're giving out good deals for luxury cars. We hopped on the Long Island Expressway and headed to Champion Motors. On the way, Bags broke down the whole story about the connection between Irv Gotti, Ja Rule, and Supreme. Bags told me Irv was a neighborhood DJ at park jams and block parties back in the day. And Irv and Ja were just two studio gangsters. Irv Gotti and Ja Rule, they were the herbs in the hood. And now Supreme's got him under his wing, Bags said. Bags passed me his pager and told me to look at the message. It was from Ja Rule's label mate, Cadillac Ty. They're over here right now. Come get him. Cadillac was referring to Ja and Irv. You see that, right? Bags turned to me and said, 
They own man lined them up for me. We just robbed them niggas for their chains. E Money Bags and Big Nose Troy were now a target of praying. To end the year in 99, Jay Z, who has a tight relationship with Irv Gotti at this time, drops his volume three, Life and Times of S. Dot Carter album in late December. On the track It's Hot, Jay responds to 50 Cent's diss on How to Rob. I'm about a dollar. What the f is 50 Cent? Jay was already buzzing, so the fact that he mentioned 50's name helped boost the hype around this unknown MC who's been killing the underground circuit. 50 capitalized on the momentum and actually used that J line at his concert. He kept on dissing Ja and dropping fire on mixtapes, but Ja Rule didn't really have anything for him musically. Ja felt like he was too big to respond since his debut album had went platinum, so he left it up to his fellow murder and crew Cadillac Ty and Black Child. They both knew 50 from the block. Black Child, who was fresh home from prison, tried to talk to 50 to back down. But according to Black, he said 50 told him everything was good to his face. But afterwards, 50 kept on dissing as usual. I remember one day when I seen 50 on the Ave. That's how real it was. He was walking to a dollar cab, and I was walking to a dollar cab. I'm talking about, we're going to get public transportation. And we had a conversation. I'm like, yo, listen, man. If it's a problem with Ja, just leave that alone. I'm home. I'm eating with rules. So if you got a beef with him, not me, leave that alone. Because we eating together. Because I knew about the song when he had murder. I don't believe you. I knew about that before he laid it. Murder. He was like, nah, I don't got no no um problems with rule. So when I heard that, you know what I mean, that was like everything in me that would tell me, yo, leave this alone or whatever, that was out the window. I was like, man, this nigga, he's a clown. 50 is now working on dropping his official album, Power of the Dollar, on Columbia Records. He'd been working with J-Lo and was introduced to Puffy, J-Lo's boyfriend at the time, and he helped ghostwrite a few records for Puff. Come March 24, 2000, Ja Rule, Irv Gotti, Black Child somehow ended up being in the same studio as 50 Cent. And someone actually put them on the spot, saying Fifth was upstairs recording. So they went upstairs to a session. They made their way in, and a scuffle breaks out with the lights going off. <laughs> it was me and a few other people. I don't even remember who was with me. It was beef, you know what I mean? Beef is when you see it in the studio or wherever and want to talk and it's like nah ain't nothing to talk about right it's like five of us and five of them and getting it on and fighting and bonk some way somehow the lights got hit hit off and was getting it on in the dark it wasn't like nobody hit the snitch like this gangster hit the switch know what i mean the and not see nothing it's just in the mix of it being so crowded and beefing somebody bumped into the light switch and it got dark that's what happened son you know what i mean because it was like 10 getting it on in the dark one of with 50 like yo where the gat at what i just start hitting bomb bomb because I, I first thing kicked in my mind if get to the gap one of us is dead but i felt the gap was in the air me and reaching for, you know what I mean? And I wasn't letting nobody get to their gun to pop me, you know what I mean? So I started poking it <laughs> straight up and down. And that's the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. <laughs> I was in the, um, in the hit factory, me and Corey Rooney. Okay. We was in the hit factory when it first went down, and they was upstairs. He was upstairs working with Tony Pope. Yeah. And I was downstairs, and then um, I was going to check them, whatever, whatever, and they came down. So I go check Ja Rule and Irvin, they had a, a session in the time. Right, in the same joint, yeah. Same joint. So I go in their room. So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting on the, on the board, by the board, and Prize come in from the Fuji's. He okay. come in. Okay. So Prize, like, they talk, talking, they talk about 50, whatever, whatever. And Prize said, upstairs right now. Uh -huh. So he threw Ja on the spot in front of everybody. You know? So he had no choice but to like, oh, let's go and get him. Yeah. No, he had to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he had to. The gun. So in the end, 50 and the engineer get stabbed at the hit factory. The engineer decided he wanted to sue. So a police report was taken since both had to go to the hospital for stitches. Ja and Irv now started to parade some paperwork that portrayed 50 Cent as cooperating. Also, the ghetto Quran track that 50 had put out in the beginning of his career, bigging up Prim and Prince, was being scrutinized by police, bolstering the snitching allegation. Prim was okay with the records before, but now he had an issue with it. 
Irv Gotti was starting to make his presence known in the industry as a hit-making producer, having been credited on all the new buzzing artist albums at the time. He produced some tracks on the soundtrack for the film Romeo Must Die, starring Aaliyah in DMX, that was released on March 28, 2000. Murder, Inc. now had the torch. He was the new Suge Knight, or so it seemed. Things have gotten a bit serious as far as the beef with 50 Cent. Before, Prem was trying to talk to 50. Now that Black Just, who 50 respected, wasn't around anymore. It was now green light on 5th. On May 24, 2000, exactly two months after the Hip Factory incident, before 50 was set to drop Power of the Dollar album, he was shot while sitting in a parked car outside of his grandmother's house. And luckily, he survived. 50 lays low and goes to the Poconos to heal up at his baby mother's family's house. From there, he pulls together a group of young hitters from his block, one of them being Bangum Smurf. 50, Bangum Smurf, E Money Bags, Troy, Ever didn't care about what the OGs did in the past, and they were ready to give it to him. 50 gets dropped from Columbia Records after the shooting, and now has to start from scratch completely broke. The power of the Dollar album got shelved. The label didn't want anything to do with the beef. He thought he was finished at this point, but 50 was determined to make it after having his first son, Marquise, and he kept his foot on the gas, dropping mixtape after mixtape from the Poconos with his G-Unit crew. 50 then drops a track, Problem Child, addressing the hit on him. In my hood, we was taught not to say who shot you. Homie that took the hit on me, couldn't shoot. And he also takes a shot at Chaz, who had set up the truce meeting in Atlanta. Oh, you the black hand of death, then why your name ain't preacher? With Prem entangled in beef with all the new knuckleheads in his hood, E Money Bags, Big Nose Troy, and 50 and his youngins, he goes low and focuses on his operation in Baltimore. It was rumored that a lot of the young boys was on his heels, especially 50 for that hit. He starts taking target practices at shooting range in Baltimore under a different alias. At around the same time, Prem started working on a crime partner movie with Ja, Snoop Dogg, and Ice T that was supposed to be produced by Murder Inc. The movie was scheduled to drop in 2001. With Black Just deaf in the air and 50 shooting, the streets were talking and the feds started paying close attention. Ja Rule's second album was scheduled to drop in October of 2000, titled Rule 336. It was a complete shift from the gritty talk that Ja was on prior. The album was more for the ladies. The album was a huge success, selling 276,000 copies in its first week and going up top the US Billboard charts. Murder Inc. was on the road. Before Jai's album dropped, he had been floating around paperwork in order of protection by 50 Cent, which 50 has denied and has been proven to be false. Order of protection. From who? Who I need order of protection from? <laughs> Your little, co oh man, these motherfuckers, man. Y'all gonna make this a lot of fun for me. Order of protection was issued automatically in a case of violent incident in New York City at the time and the person who was pressing charges or wanted to sue was the engineer at the hit factory, not anyone affiliated with 50. 2001 was a bloody year. On July 16th at a barbecue in Queens, E Money Bags was shot 11 times. While sitting in his parked truck he had just bought, he must have seen the shooters coming up, but wasn't quick enough because he died with his gun in his hand. Then on the 21st day of October, Big Nose Troy, Bag's partner in crime, was also hit up at close range, dropping to the ground. The shooters then stood over him and hit him seven more times while laying on the ground. That same year in 2001, Murder Inc. roster grew. Irv Gotti added some female MCs to the mix with Charlie Baltimore and Ashanti, and they both appeared on Ja Rule's third album, Pain Is Love, another soft tempo album that came out on October 2nd, 2001, selling 361,000 copies in its first week and dominated US Billboard charts at number one. The album was certified platinum by June of 2002. Ja was on top of his game. 
Meanwhile, 50 Cent was laying low after the shooting at Sha Money XL's house, his new manager. During his time at Sha Money's house, 50 recorded two mixtapes, 50 Cent is the Future and Guess Who's Back, which saw him become a breakthrough star on New York's underground rap scene. Once again, 50 without any official album out was back dominating the underground music scene. People wanted that gritty shit and they were starting to get tired of all that singing and commercial pop music that was being put out by Ja Rule and the likes of Nelly at the time. On October 30th, 2002, Jam Master J, who first introduced 50 Cent to the music business, was shot and killed execution style in his recording studio in Jamaica, Queens. The streets is now talking and fingers were pointing towards Prem at the time because of the 50 beef. On November 19, 2002, Ja Rule drops The Last Temptation, his fourth studio album, which sold 237,000 copies in his first week, less than his previous Pain is Love album. The album was certified platinum by December 13th, and although the album was successful on paper, it was highly criticized for being too watered down and commercial. Towards the end of 2002, 50's mixtapes were catching some steam, and it gets to an up-and-coming Detroit MC, Eminem, who then introduces 50 to Dr. Dre. 50 now gets signed a Shady Aftermath label. I heard it. I brought it to Dre. Dre heard it. He was sold. And basically we said, let's, let's do a joint venture. Up until this point, Ja Rule had dominated the airwaves and charts with his pop-friendly albums. A new wave was now coming up, 50 Cent. His name has been buzzing in the underground scene and people are now anticipating his debut album to drop after signing with Aftermath. In late December of 2002, after Jam Master J's death, Supreme was arrested in Miami after he caught a gun charge in New York and in Maryland for taking shooting lessons under the alias Lee Tutton. The feds who had been investigating him and his new associates in Maryland and North Carolina had found evidence at a stash house including a certificate from a select fire tactical shooting range. Prem as a convict is not supposed to be around firearms or let alone have a target practice certificate. Prem is also being probed but hasn't been charged for a few murders in New York and in Baltimore, including the hit on E Money Bags and Big Nose Troy. Police were eyeing the possibilities that he might have had something to do with 50 Cent's shooting and the recent killing of Jam Master J. The streets were talking. Murder Inc.'s office gets raided on January 3rd, 2003. The feds were trying to make a link of Murder Inc. as a money laundering operation for Supreme. The same day Murder Inc.'s office gets raided on January 3rd, 2003, the lead single for 50 Cent's anticipated debut album in a club came out and it was an instant success. The underground giant has now made his way to the mainstream media. Some of the songs on the album had already made his way to the bootleggers, so Interscope released the album early on February 6, 2003. The album peaked at number one on the US Billboard 200, selling over 872,000 copies in its first week. The album was ranked number one on the US Billboard year-end 2003, on a track Wankster, which was already out on mixtapes prior to the release, is where he dissed Jai Evy. That song was so catchy, even the babies were reciting the verses. 50 Mania was in full effect. The tides had turned. 50 now had the resources to up his security and go after anyone. Prem is beyond bars waiting to get sentenced for the gun charges while also under federal investigations, just like Irv and his Murder Inc. label, whose offices were just raided. On January 16, 2003, an unknown gunman opened fire in the offices of Violator Records and Violator Management, which is Chris Lighty's company, who was responsible for managing 50 Cent. On February 24, 2003, Chris Gotti, Irv Gotti's brother is shot in his left leg outside of Murder Hank's offices. Police were trying to figure out if it was self-inflicted. A few months later, Ja Rule drops Loose Change in April to combat 50's onslaught, but the track didn't really go anywhere. 
On one of the tracks on Get Rich or Die Trying, many men, 50 laid out a few clues in the song. He mentioned Slim. Slim switch sides on me, let Nick ride on me. Which is another name for Chaz of Black Ant Entertainment, switching sides on him. Chaz, a notorious bank robber, had bodyguard and played role manager role for him before. 50 also drops the name of the person who allegedly shot him, Hamo. In the Bible it says, what goes around comes around. Hamo shot me, three weeks later he got shot down. There are a few contradictory stories out there on the streets about who specifically took the hit. With some insinuating, it was another individual, God B, and a guy named Son. But nobody was ever charged to confirm the accuracy of both claims. Daryl Baum Hamo who was Mike Tyson's friend and bodyguard, was shot in an unrelated event three weeks after 50's shooting on April 20th, 2000, by Damian Lord Hardy and his guys, another notorious crew out of Brooklyn. Interesting enough, 50 and World ended up going back and forth after 50 disrespected his then-girlfriend, Little Kim, on the radio. World pulled up to Jerry City Doubletree Hotel on September 9th and took shots at 50 in his entourage and someone returned fire as they were entering the building. Nobody was hit. The crazy thing about that incident in Jersey City is the fact that Ja Rule was literally down the street at the Hyatt Hotel, but nobody knew and they never crossed paths. In September, a member of 50's entourage, Shadaha Bay, was shot and killed in Southside Jamaica, Queens. Four days later, a Murder Inc. affiliate, Dio Cannon, was gunned down a few blocks away. Although no connections were made, there were huge speculations and rumors floating around. 50 still got his foot on the gas, going off and attacking Ja and Irv on wax. There was no more Supreme to hold them down, and they were under federal investigations for their associations. Ja Rule drops Blood In My Eye, his fifth studio album, on November 4th, 2003 and it debuts at number six on the U.S. Billboard 200, selling 140,000 units in its first week, which was a fraction of its early releases. The album wasn't really well received by many who thought Ja was still continuing to backbiting with the death row camp trying to imitate Tupac. Tupac cut his head ball, then you want to shut your head ball. You pussy. Tupac wear a bandana. You want to wear a bandana. Tupac yeah. put a cross on his back. You want to put crosses on your back. You ain't Tupac. On November 14, 2003, 50's Camp G Unit dropped their first debut album, introducing the world to Tony Yayo, Lloyd Banks, and Young Buck. The album debuts at number three on the U.S. Billboard 200, selling 377,000 copies in its first week another 330,000 copies the following week. G-Unit Takeover was now in full effect. The tides had officially turned. I told y'all I'm a hustler, it's like you keep on forgetting. 36 million, eight months, you still think I'm bullsh**. Catch me on top of Fortune Top 100. Head of G-Unit Enterprises, still getting it. with them selling the rap. It's two different games, but they run parallel to each other, so they're quite the same. <laughs> on June 29, 2004, Lloyd Banks drops his first album, Hunger for More, and debuts at number one on the U.S. Billboard charts, selling over 433,000 copies in its first week. On August 24, 2004, Young Buck, straight out of Cashville, drops. The album debuts at number three, selling 261,000 copies in its first week. Everybody dissed Ja Rule, from the whole unit to Eminem, D12, Busta Rhymes, the list goes on. It was like a lyrical barrage of punches hitting Ja Rule everywhere. On November 9th, 2004, a defeated Ja Rule tried to make a comeback dropping his sixth studio album, titled Rule. He taps Fat Joe and Jada Kiss for the track New York, which got a lot of spin on the airwaves. The record was hot. 50 was not feeling this, so he goes after Fat Joe and Jada for giving Ja some life. 50 was not letting up, even though everybody had basically turned Ja off literally. 
on January 25th, 2005, Irv and his brother Chris Gotti were indicted on money laundering charges in connection with Supreme. The feds were alleging that Murder Inc. was funded by Prime's drug money, using one specific straight-to-DVD movie, Crime Partners, as an example. The feds were alleging that Prime was dropping off cash to fund the expenses and getting checks for Murder Inc. Simultaneously, Prime, who was already behind bars on a gun case, is indicted for running a criminal enterprise, two murders in New York, E money bags and big nose Troy, another two bodies in Baltimore by a stash house that caused it to be raided. He was also a suspect in the Jam Master J murder and the 50 shooting, but he was never charged for those. They wanted him gone. The prosecutors, they were dangling a death penalty. And the feds, they were willing to jam up anybody that they saw funding them in any way, form, or fashion. Murder Inc.'s accountants execs are now getting caught up in a probe and the feds started to threaten murder inc's parent company universal music group if they keep funding murder inc they might get hit with money laundering charges the mighty murder inc label was now fighting for his life the feds had accomplished something by jamming up irv they had cut off all of supreme's resources so he could not afford high power lawyers the once powerful Prem's now only choice at representation was illegal aid. On March 3rd, 2005, 50 drops his sophomore album, The Massacre, amidst a feud with the game, his new West Coast addition to the group. The album sold 1.15 million copies in its first four days of release. It had sold up to 3 million copies by April. It was ranked number one album of the year on U.S. Billboard 200. With the feds having a 99.9% .9 conviction rate at the time, Irv and his brother Chris Gotti were acquitted of the money laundering charges that had brought against them. They had nothing to offer of Supreme's dealings outside of their business relationship. They wanted murders that they had no info on. I'm never getting into any other trouble, though. You could put your bottom dollar on <laughs> us. Never, no jaywalking, no nothing. Yeah, yeah. Following the acquittal, Irv worked to revamp the company, but the damage was already done. The public perception was that they had lost the war to 50 Cent. On February 9, 2007, Preem was found guilty and spared the death penalty, getting life instead. Throughout the years that followed, 50 has humiliated Ja and Irv every now and then. He even pokes fun at Jay-Z, who looked up to Prime and was a part of Irv's come-up story. His idea is, yo, leave them alone, they off them our food. Cause he's eating off them. Like when the when the feds are saying, yo, why he's saying, yo, we beat the feds. You never beat nothing. You wasn't involved in nothing. They really washed you up to make sure that they got him so you couldn't help him. Financially. Yeah, they only put you in the case to eat you. Mm -hmm. He'll tell you he was two million in the hole in, mm -hmm. in the thing. I think I, I think I heard that. He said that on Drink Champ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, why yeah. you two million in the hole is to make sure you can't help him. He went to trial with illegal aid. Mm. That they never had a hung jury, no nothing. These words out of his mouth. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When I go see Biz, I go see Cat and, and Clinton. Mm -hmm. Cat go, yeah, he fed that up. He go, I don't understand. He was supposed to have both. Why he choose? You see what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. he's digging on. Y'all from you from it? Like you mm -hmm. from it? That autom that's automatic. And he going. I understand that these kids are trying to make death row. In September of 2013, Jaru and Irv Gotti admitted defeat on an interview at Hot 97. You say now, you could say in in hindsight, you could say yes. We, well, we well, took an L. There. Yeah, we took an L. But listen, the thing about it is, when you're going through it, you, you know you're going through it. So yeah. you got to think ways. But I, I I'll, I'll take you back to we was in my office, me and Rule, right? We in the office, and Flex was about to play in the club, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Flex plays in the club. That record was so dope. I looked at yeah. Rule, like I looked at Rule, I said, yo, <laughs> have a major problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you really say that? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And see, now we're in such a thing, and I'm happy that we can talk about it. Man. Yeah, we took, we, we took the L. We took the L. A few months later, in November, 
Ja and 50 both crossed paths for the first time since the Hit Factory incident while on the same flight together. Nothing happened. On October 2018, 50 buys 200 front row seats to Ja's concert to make it look empty and to troll him. 50 made light of the low ticket prices. People think I'm mean, so go see this. 15 bucks? Wait, what? what I do now? He wrote as an Instagram caption alongside a photo of the tickets being sold on Groupon. It's very clear that these two individuals in camps are married till death do them apart. 50 even alluded to this on November 2018. Southside rules applies. It's never over. We may take a break, but it ain't over till one of us gone. The never ending beef that went on for over two decades. Let me know what y'all think. Also, if I missed anything, drop it in the comments below. Until next time, peace.